Well, I thought today I would talk about 10 of things that are just indispensable to me, things I cannot live without in the garden. And I apologize, we've got a chainsaw going on back here, but hopefully you can hear me. So I'm getting ready to prune this lavender. And let's start out with number one. I use these dollar store scissors on so many different things. I will dig with them. I will uh, really ply out weeds with them. I'll even use them as a little shovel because they're a dollar and I don't really care if I mess with them too much. But that said, they are really, really sturdy and they're only a dollar. I have, I don't know how many pair of these and I keep them just absolutely everywhere and they are the little Betty Crocker ones and they come from the dollar store. So I have lots of these. Number two, I always have some kind of disinfecting wipe. Now I've got Clorox ones here. I think we can find them relatively easily again. And it doesn't really matter if it's an, an off brand, if it's a, a name brand, it doesn't really matter. But in between every one of my cuts, I like to give it a wipe. Okay, so that is my number one and my number two. Now let's move on to three and four. Okay, so why am I disinfecting my shears in between each cut? Well, it's because I have something going on on my rosemary and some of my topiaries, maybe this lavender one also. I'm not sure what it is, but I've, I, it's one of two things. It's either leaf spot, which is a fungal infection, or it's spider mite. I'm not really sure. In either case, I am going to tackle it heads on, and I'm gonna use two different products that I rely on extensively. One is just a basic insecticidal soap, and that will tackle oh, most pests. I may have to reapply it on a number of different occasions, but nevertheless, it's an organic control. This brand is garden safe, but there are different varieties that you can get out there. You can also make your own. If you look online, you can find all sorts of homemade recipes for insecticidal soap. Now, also something to tackle both your pests and any pesty uh, viruses or fungal issues or whatever is neem oil and I use this religiously and all I do is just kind of spray it on I will use it um, really I'll, I'll use it on my edibles I will use it on just about anything I am careful when I spray both of these that I don't spray in the heat of the day I will spray when it is shady and I will make sure to kind of pay attention when I last spray to see if it is really doing the Trick. but I have both of these and I will put links below. So that would be my number three and my number four, insecticide and fungal control. Whew, this fish oil stinks, but it also does the trick. And here's my question of the day. How do you decide which of your plants is really going to get extra special TLC? And you know what I mean, some plant that just really doesn't look its best, but you know you can make it look and grow and thrive a lot better if you just really give it a little bit of TLC. And today I am doing that with my lavender topiaries. This side looks good this one not so good. So today this is my targeted TLC plant of the day. So here are my number five and my number six things I absolutely can't live without. When I am giving a plant some TLC, I'm obviously going to fertilize it. I've talked a lot about this slow release fertilizer, Osmocote. I use it in most of my container plantings when I first start to plant. It is not necessarily organic, but I don't really, I'm not really that concerned concerned about that when I'm using uh, container plantings because it's not really affecting the soil quality in general. So I like to use Osmocote. I'll put a link below. And then when I want to really give something a good feed on my edibles, on my topiaries, and I want it to act very, very quickly, very effectively, and very safely, then I will use a liquid organic. Now I've got fish fertilizer here, which works 
brilliantly, it also stinks. So I would encourage you to look at some of the other things in the Espoma Organic Liquid line. There's Liquid Start, there's Liquid Bloom, there's Liquid Grow. All of them work really, really well. You don't have to be um, extremely fastidious about measuring, which makes it very, very quick and easy to use. You can use them on your indoor plants, on your outdoor plants, though I might recommend using the less stinky versions if you're going to be using them indoors. Now let's move on to the next ones. I told Stuart, okay, now just keep shooting, I've got a little surprise. So here's my surprise, because it's just a bonus thing that is not necessarily essential, but it's very handy to have around. And you guys know I'm always forgetting to use it, but today I remembered. And that is if you have a little Lazy Susan that you can use when you're working on smaller container plantings on your tabletop, you can access all sides with just a twirl without having to lift up a heavy container like this one. So even though I usually forget to use it or I'm, in too, I'm too impatient to find it, I nevertheless would say that it is definitely one of Linda's little helpers and that is a little carousel for when you are trimming your topiaries and pruning and grooming your container plants. Well, let's move on to seven and eight. As you guys know, I've been doing lots of really scary things in the potage. I'm moving some boxwood around, I'm clipping it, I'm trimming it. And one thing I find indispensable after I do that is wilt proof. And what this is, is something that is ready to use, proven long lasting anti-transparent. And what this does is it helps prevent moisture loss from the foliage on anything that you've just pruned. And this time of year, I think that is really really, really valuable. It will help uh, prevent some of that browning you sometimes get after you've clipped something. And so I will use it. Oh, shh, Stuart, turn very, very quietly. There's a hummingbird right behind you. Did you catch it? Sorry, but it was beautiful. It was on the wajilia. Now it's up on the limb. Can you see it? See that little branch that's sticking out right by the power line? It's kind of curled. Can you see it? Oh, there it is. Now it just flew away. Sorry for that little uh, interruption, but when there is a hummingbird, you absolutely have to stop everything and appreciate it. And it was loving that pink wajilia that I have in, in uh, boy, the birds are going crazy today, uh, right behind Stuart. So I'm sorry for that, but I enjoyed that little interruption tremendously. Okay, so what was I talking about? Oh, I was talking about this wilt proof. I'll put a link below. Uh, this stuff is really great. I got it off of Amazon. I can't always find it at my nursery or home improvement store, so a lot of times I just order it. So I will put this in a link below. It's also great for your winter evergreens and your winter Christmas boughs and things that you want to preserve. So if you've got an evergreen wreath, holly, conifer, um, any of those kinds of things, then this is great also in the winter time to uh, prevent moisture loss from your seasonal decor. Okay, if you follow me for any length of time, you know how much I love to elevate things on plant stands. And here is a perfect example. I have them in all sorts of different sizes. This is one that um, I designed myself. It's available now on QVC. I'll put a link below and I don't know how many of these are still left you guys. So if you want them, then you might want to check. Go to qvc.com and just put in my name and these will come up. They come in copper and galvanized and this black. Now you may say, so what's so special about it? Well, what's special about it, to me at least, was that I felt it was just the right circumference and just the right hip to be able to be used on indoor plants, outdoor plants. I can use it on small plants. I can use it on big guys like this one. 
and you can see how sturdy it is. I can also use it on really, really large plants. So in general, whether I get them at Goodwill or on QVC or at my home improvement store, I absolutely find plant stands indispensable. Another reason that I think they're so valuable is because they protect the floor underneath, they can protect your baskets from rotting, and they also will prevent the drainage hole in your planters for, from getting clogged up when there is direct soil and pot to your flower bed. That contact can sometimes uh, cause a, an issue with drainage and plugging up the drainage hole. So there you go. Those are my, what are we on Stuart? Seven and eight, I think. Okay, so let's move on to nine and 10. So since my TLC, Tender Loving Care plant of the day is this rosemary, and by the way, I don't see any signs of any kind of infection on this foliage. That's why I'm not wiping in between each cut here. Give you some little topiary tips as I do it. Sometimes you guys on topiaries, it's the ones that hang low that are the ones that need to be taken off, that are scruffy looking. And sometimes that's the older foliage too that tends to be a little bit long in the tooth and not so attractive. So I'm giving this some TLC so you guys are getting some of my, my essentials but also some little topiary pruning tips. Something else that I will do a little bit later is this guy isn't standing up and flying right. It really, to be vertical, and that really bugs me. And to be vertical, it needs to be about right here. So a little bit later, I can, I can do a, several things. I can put a stake in it and try to make it stand up. But typically I don't like to do that because the root ball's already established. And this time of year, if I don't have to, I don't really like to puncture the root ball. Sometimes, and a little bit later, I'll probably try it. I can gently turn it on its side and the entire root ball will come out without really, I think, disturbing the plant too much. And in that case, then I can just gently torque the root ball, press it down on this side, add a little bit more soil on that side, and I can get it to stay straight. Sometimes also I can just kind of push it like this, make it go vertical, and then kind of compress the soil around it again so that it will start growing vertically. So there's just a couple of tips. If that bothers you as much as it bothers me, if you're as, as kind of fastidious as I am, then there's a little tip. And I'm just gonna keep on pruning this. But you guys know that after I prune as a finishing touch, let me go ahead and see if I can get this topiary finished for you. Look inside here. You can see that there's some dead wood in here. And then I sometimes need to take some pruners. And these, these are indispensable, but they're actually not on my list because I'm assuming you guys already have some pretty good pruners. I'm just going to prune out all of this dead stuff. And in this area here, I'm going to be a little bit more harsh. There's a stub there I don't want. Ooh, I about got Stuart in the eye. Stuart, did I get you? Okay. So I'm just gonna really clean out all that dead wood in there. So a lot of this is just grooming. Sometimes after I prune one of my topiaries, and if they've been in full sun or kind of semi-shade, I'll probably put them back in not as strong a sun so that they can kind of recover a little bit. And by the way, if you guys say, oh, I can't keep a lavender topiary alive, well, I can't either, which is why almost every year I have new ones. But sometimes I can, and sometimes I can get them to last for a year or two, and that makes me happy. And especially they will last for maybe a year or two 
if I do like I'm doing right now, see how I've kind of cleaned that out and given it a chance to start over. I'm sorry, Stuart, I should have twirled that in your direction. I'm going to take that whole thing off. You know it? There. Clip off some of that older foliage, those older leaves. And then when I go on vacation, normally, of course, when you're at home, you want the pretty side to face you like this. But if I'm on vacation, that's when I put the ugly side out to get lots of sun so that it will fill in. But for right now, I'm going to let you guys see just the pretty side. I'll keep the ugly side to myself. So finally, now that I've given this some TLC, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to now, ideally, I would have had something covering the soil so that all of those clippings would have dropped on it and I could have easily removed them. Sometimes I'll do this. And you'll notice how the gravel pretty much stays in place and it's only the lighter weight clippings that come off. Sorry, Stuart. And then when most of them are gone, then what I'll do is I will spray the soil itself with some of my neem oil in case of fungal issues or insecticidal soap. Sometimes I will then top dress it with a little bit of compost, but you guys know what I'm going to do once I am finished completely. And that is some of my little lavender clippings got in there. It's very fragrant. I will completely top this with one of the most indispensable things in my garden and in my life in general. And that would be just pea gravel that I get at Lowe's by the bag. It's called Earth Naturals. It's about $3 a bag. I love it. If I buy it in really large quantities, then I get it at um, a stone supplier. So there you go. And so that was my number nine. And finally, my number 10, probably the most frequently asked about thing of all time, and that is my Barnell long-bladed, long-handled pruners. I love these so much that I just got another pair, and it took me a long time to get them, and I will apologize because these didn't used to be so hard to get, and now on Amazon, um, even other locations, they're kind of hard to find. And I, I don't know if I had something to do with that or not, but I know hundreds and hundreds of you have ordered these because they're wonderful. They're lightweight, they're aluminum, they have a wonderful pointy tip, so you can really isolate something you want to clip. Like in here, see, let's say I just wanted to clip that. See how easily I can isolate what I want? Well, that's got a little, ah, but I can isolate what I want to clip because of these pointy, pointy tips. They work brilliantly. And these I really do, uh, I really do take care of. And I give these TLC every time after I use them, just like I gave my lavender. So that would be my number 10, absolutely indispensable. I will put a link below. You may have to wait a while. They're not cheap, but I promise you, they are absolutely the bomb. They're just the bomb. And so I will put a link to those below. That is my number 10. And here is my bonus round. Show yours off, Stuart. Here is another bonus thing that I just discovered that I really love you guys. And these are these mosquito bracelets. They're deep free, kid safe. When used as directed, they come in all sorts of fun, different little colors. And what I like about them is that they're reusable. So it's got a Ziploc bag that they come in. And when you're finished, like a lot of times, Stuart and I will be shooting in the morning and then we go into the studio to work in the, after, in the afternoon or in the late morning. And then we can just put them back in their Ziploc bag. They're kind of color coded. We put our name on the outside of the bag and then we can put them back on and they're ready to go the next day. So that's just a little bonus round, the Cligonic 
mosquito repellent band. You guys have a great weekend. Well, I haven't done, I don't think, a fashion ensemble in a while, so if you're not familiar with my channel and you don't want this content, turn off your phone right now. If you do, here we go. So today's ensemble, I, I actually have a question of the day for this little outfit. One of my little joys I, I really relish every day is deciding what kind of earrings I'm going to wear and also what kind of sunglasses I'm going to wear. It's an inexpensive way to really jazz up your outfit and it's just a little rush of pleasure that I like to give myself. So here's my question of the day. So I have two pair of sunglasses. Really wanted a summer vibe. So do you guys like a white sunglasses? Very, uh, very Audrey Hepburn, I think. Very, uh, I don't know very Audrey Hepburn, very 60s. Or these kind of buff colored ones, kind of cat eye, kind of cat woman. So there you go. Let me know A or B, if you were me, which ones would you wear today? Okay, now onto my, onto my ensemble. So my earrings are these wonderful acrylics hoops. They've got a really 60s vibe. I actually got these at Walmart a couple of years ago. I have worn them a lot. I love big hoop earrings. These I think look a lot more expensive than they are and they came in a couple of different colors. I don't know if they still have them or not. So I really, really like these earrings, acrylic earrings. They were maybe four or five dollars. Uh, my shirt is J. Crew. This was actually a thrift store find, but it is J. Crew. I've had this for a couple of years. I love it. And when it gets really, really hot out, it's, it's just a little bit too warm to wear anything tight. So that's why I start wearing things that are a little bit looser. My britches are also J. Crew. These are not thrifted. These are matchstick quarter length or three quarter length britches and I really like them. My sandals I think are just so cute. I've had these for about three years. I get lots of compliments on them. They're platform sandals. They are extremely comfortable and they kind of have a 4th of July vibe. I got these at Forever 21. My bracelet came from Steinmart many, many years ago. And my ring, here's another question. Do you guys wear your wedding ring when you're working in the garden? I try to never do. Sometimes it's accidental, but I usually don't, which means sadly in the summer, a lot of times I don't wear my wedding ring. But I sometimes do wear other rings that are really easy to pop on and pop off. This is a Banana Republic from a number of years ago. So there is your ensemble du jour.